most people you know, take that for granted, but you talk about other ingredients and they do look at your dumpling and go, what's that? Um, you should soak your almonds over. Yep, oh. make almond milk, soak it. Also gets rid of some of the toxins in there. Um, again, most important, max 10 to 20% of the diet. Um, so that's, I think, the key difference, I guess, where I come from is I still don't mind a bit of carbohydrate, but I think it's really important to make sure that it's 10 to max 20. And I would say I used to I used to do this increased levels for kidney failure. Don't anymore. Don't do that. Basically, what I do now is increase protein. So again, I need to re rewrite some of this. Is that dogs or, and, and cats or yep. both? Yeah, cats probably five percent. Um, so yeah, grain or no grain, it's been obviously a topic of conversation. I think it's blurred by the fact that we should be talking about carbohydrate levels, not blaming grains unfairly. They do naturally occur in the stomach of prey animals. I mean, herbivores that graze um, you know, grasslands uh, and move with the grass tend to follow it while it's in full growth and heading with seed heads because that's where the nutritional com value comes from. So you know, that's what migratory animals migrate for, is to follow the growth. Um, so yes, they do. I don't believe they cause allergies. The reason I say that point blank is that I mean I've been using my base diet to treat allergies, and I reckon I get about an 80% success rate in managing them. So if all of these grains were causing allergies, I can't understand how I'm fixing them with this particular base diet. So what I do agree is that about one in 20 allergic dogs will have a gluten issue, and they're the ones that don't respond particularly well to oats, even though it's probably the lowest gluten uh, um, ingredient. And so as I said, my IBD cases and my unresponsive, so I will go on to a gluten-free diet. But again, we're not cooking them, you know? we're not doing that, we're not creating this krill line, we're not cooking them, we're not adding them at 50% of the diet. So there's a real difference between um, you know, grain or no grain argument, and as I said, I think it's been blurred, and we all get sort of conned to rushing out and buying a grain-free diet, no offence intended, um, only to read the packet and find out it's full of potato starch instead of grain. So what we've done is replaced one carbohydrate with another, but we haven't addressed the low meat, high carb ratio issue. Veggie matter, again, principle of raw, but we've got to remind ourselves, as we talked about earlier, um, dogs and cats basically do not digest and break down the cell walls or cellulose, so you need to physically macerate and present these products in a format that the dogs can get uh, value from. Um, grated, minced, put them in the blender, use the pulp from your fruit processor, all that sort of thing, but you need to physically macerate it. Again, if the dog was getting this from the gut content of a herbivore, all of that chewing, all of the probiotics, all of the digestions already happen, so they can actually quite easily eat that nice slurry of gut content or the feces that come out, which dogs do quite naturally. Um, steaming veggies works, but it does. You do kill some of the vitamins, so always make sure they're crispy if you're going to use some steamed veggies. Uh, they provide roughage, micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, fibre, um, all the things that we eat veggies for ourselves. It's the same reason, but they don't need anywhere near as much. Things to avoid, uh, high levels of spinach can create calcium oxalate levels that can lead to stone formation. Raw onion, as we discussed, high body anemia. Cabbage will make dogs fat like crazy. Um, and tomatoes, again, can be incriminated in forming high levels of oxalates. Yeah, big question. I get this asked this one all the time. Well, what a, what's wrong with my dog? He's eating grass. Actually, there's nothing wrong with your dog. It's quite normal for a dog to eat grass. But they're very selective. There's two types of grass eating. Dog that's feeling nauseous and wants to purge, basically goes out and goes and just eats any old grass that's there. The tannins in the grass get into the stomach and they cause it to vomit. If they're nutritionally eating, and you can see what this dog's doing here, they actually run the blade, if you watch them closely, they run the blade of grass through their mouth before they pick it. And what they're feeling for is the little tiny sharp edges, because mature grass has little sharp barbs on it and they can detect it with their mouth. The very young shoots, which is like we get when we go in and get our wheat grass and barley grass shots, is only four days old, the cellulose hasn't formed, so it's totally digestible. So when they eat grass nutritionally, they pick tiny little bits, and you'll see them, they're quite fussy about it, they go along the edge and pick the ones out, or they eat like a motor mower to make themselves sick. So why do we add parsley and wheatgrass to our food? Because most dogs these days, a lot of dogs even have a backyard of grass. So what do they do? They run around, it's paved, it's concrete, there's no grass. And we put grass in our food for that very reason. Um, you know, they know why they eat it. So that's what you see in your boost juice. We harvest this stuff, powder it, mix it into our formula. Just quickly touch through on some supplements. Um, so ye yeast, um, we use inactivated yeast, obviously. I mean, live yeast obviously can cause problems with allergies, so we use inactivated yeast. It's basically for its nutritional value. B-complex vitamins, 
chromium, which is essential to the production of insulin. So again, if you've got a uh, diabetic animal, I'll put them on chromium picolinate, which is trivalent for chromium. Also add to that uh, cinnamon and gymnema, 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 I remember the name of that herb. Did you think of Kepa going back to the top one? Mm, it's good. Yeah, yeah Kepa's a nice, uh, a nice product. Uh, so kelp we talked about, importantly low dose, don't go over the board with kelp. Um, you know, I put enough in to make sure that I have uh, enough iodine, but I also know the iodine content of the kelp that we use. Um, Lecithin we add basically uh, is important for the liver fat metabolism and it also forms the, the myelin sheath on nerves. Calcium, the reason I add calcium is that you cannot rely on owners to feed the appropriate amount of bones. Pure and simple. I mean, they will tell you I feed bones, they might be feeding chicken necks that have no calcium. Or, um, so we make sure in our formula that the base mix has enough calcium to reach the optimal 1.2 to 1 calcium phosphorus ratio. I'd rather assume that everyone lied to me and didn't do it and have the balanced diet. And then if they eat a couple of extra bones, big deal. Uh, there was a terrible study done back in the late 80s that was trying to prove that too much calcium created hip dysplasia and elbow dysplasia. It was one of the worst, if you look at the science behind it, one of the worst scientific studies ever done. But unfortunately our vets caught that and we were probably all trained, I know it was in we my day. Still, still refer back to that one. Absolutely. If you looked at the diet that they were fed, that was where the problem was, but anyway, I won't go to it. So you can handle calcium. If you don't need calcium, you wear it out. It's as simple as that. Um, vitamin C, always you know, always an argument, why do we have vitamin C to a diet? You know, dogs and cats can form vitamin C, that's true. They're not very good at doing it. They're actually very slow at manufacturing their own vitamin C. Not as people and guinea pigs as we know don't, so that's why we need our exotic <coughs> source of vitamin C. Dogs and cats are particularly slow. Um, it's been shown that goats can increase their vitamin C production by 12 fold in 24 hours. It takes a dog a week to achieve the same increase. So if this dog happens to drop down with parvo and it's under massive stress, and vitamin C is an antioxidant wants to boost up. Um, if you've got an exogenous source there in its diet, you're always setting it up for uh, success. And basically vitamin C again, powerful antioxidant. If your body's got too much, you wear that. No big drama, expensive way, but um, at the end of the day, I'd rather have that little extra. Contentious issue, garlic. <laughs> again, low levels. We talked about garlic earlier today. Um, it is related to the onion. There has been some evidence of Heinz body stuff. The only study I could ever find uh, that actually proved Heinz body anemia from garlic was a study done by an Indian vet. He fed the equivalent of, I'm trying to remember what it was, one, I think it was one gram per kilogram um, of garlic, fresh white garlic to dogs. So 40 kilo dog had 40 grams of garlic, fresh garlic served to it. And yes, you got Heinz body anemia in a number of dogs. I think the um, with the horses was 100 grams per yeah. So it's a ridiculous amount. I mean, the point being is the studies have to go to massive levels to get toxicity, which basically is true of many things in life. Um, at the end of the day, yeah, so, I mean, it is safe at low levels. I've been feeding garlic 20 years to dogs. I've never seen a case of mind body anemia, ever. And I've done gazillion blood tests on the animals that eat my formula in my diet. So I'm pretty comfortable at low levels. Um, and we do use dried, which somehow reduces toxicity. You know, does it do anything to parasites? Can't tell you. Supposedly does, but I can't say I've seen that in practice. Um, taste and aroma, definitely. It does improve taste and aroma of food. Um, so there's you know, reasonable reasons to have some there. Talked about wheatgrass and parsley. Parsley is a super powerful green food. It's one of those you know world number one you know World Health Organization recommended product we should all be eating more of. Same with wheatgrass. Um, these are full of antioxidants, anti-cancer things, vitamins, minerals, trace elements, particularly if they're grown organically. Um, so a terrific supplement to throw into your, to your dog food. And horses love it too, they do really well on it if you can be bothered. Probiotics, as I mentioned before, this is old because I'm still recommending Protex. Right. Uh, Enzyplex, um, certainly as I said I use a lot of enzyme supplements. Flexidol is an omega-3 supplement. Uh, two things I've certainly used uh, in my treatment of uh, degenerative joint disease over the years. Boron's an interesting one. Uh, I want just a quick one to mention there. Australia is the most boron deficient country in the world. Boron's a micronutrient. It should be in the surface soil, so it should come through all our food chains. Because Australia has basically frozen and thawed and been underwater and over, all our topsoil's been washed away and basically most of the boron's gone. It's the reason we have the high, we have the number one osteoporosis rate in the world. Boron is a micronutrient required to assimilate calcium into the bone matrix. If you don't have enough boron, it doesn't matter how much vitamin D and calcium you shove down your gut it won't get into your bones. So 
it's also highly toxic. It's what's in borax. So you, when you're supplementing with boron, you're talking tiny, tiny, tiny amount, but it's also a key nutrient. We talked about how you can you manage uh, horses with arthritis long term. There's one of your secret ingredients. Quarter of a teaspoon twice a week for boron or borax powder. Take copies. Mm -hmm.